everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, to give a summary of some of the work that is currently in progress. And it really is uh, a progress report. Mm -hmm. I want to pause for just a moment with this uh, opening slide to point out on the left, in the middle of the, that set of three, the tiny um, image of Iapetus. Uh, my interest in Iapetus hence the issue of organics and solar system. It goes back to the 1970s. And uh, while I would love to give this as an historical presentation, I'm going to have to jump right into the details. I know that Faith has had a, a long time interest in Iapetus as well. Uh, but anyway, moving right up to the modern era, let's go to the next slide. I want to remind you of a slide that Yvonne showed yesterday, which is a spectrum of the 3.4 micron region in three different sources, uh, one of which is uh, meteorite dust, a piece of uh, Murchison, and it was done in the lab, of course, as well as a uh, deeper galaxy, and also a sight line <coughs> through, through stellar medium in our galaxy. And the striking thing is mm -hmm. a very great similarity of all these things, uh, overlaying at the same scale and so on. And at the uh, top, I've indicated the four components of the aliphatic band, symmetric and asymmetric, both of CH3 and CH2, uh, as well as indicating on the left where a CH stretch in aromatic hydrocarbons exists, although we don't really clearly see it at all in these uh, astronomical sources or really even in the Murchison material. Next, please. This is kind of a guidepost to, to where I'm going with this talk, at least uh, for the part related to satellites and Saturn. Uh, this is a slide that shows the three outer satellites of Saturn, uh, <clears throat> beginning at the outermost uh, with TV, and a few of its characteristics. It is in a retrograde inclined orbit and is widely presumed to have been captured by the Saturn system, uh, probably early on, uh, but it is most likely a reprobate from the, the Kuiper belt, having, uh, in that case, formed a considerably greater heliocentric distance than the Saturn, at least currently. Is. And the characteristics of Iapetus, I think a lot of people already know. Hyperion is a, is a strange object that's in a chaotic rotation and has a remarkably low density of just uh, under 0.6 grams per cc. Mm -hmm. So these are the uh, cast of characters that we have been uh, working with using Cassini data. And let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is also a reminder of what Yvonne showed yesterday, and that is the fairly recent result, really, Starting at around 2010, when Anne Derbyshire and her colleagues discovered this ring uh, around Saturn in the orbit of Phoebe. And from that, it, it deduced that uh, the ring consists of dust liberated from Phoebe by an impact, uh, maybe not so long ago, because these dust rings don't tend to last forever. Uh, her, their initial discovery was in the space telescope, uh, has been confirmed in data from the wide spacecraft. In, and is discussed in detail in a more recent paper by Doug Hamilton and uh, his colleagues. So let's go ahead uh, with the next slide, please. And have, with that view in mind that there is dust coming in from the Phoebe ring, spiraling in towards Saturn, uh, what becomes of it? Well, the next satellite inward is Iapetus. And as you know, Iapetus is in a lot synchronous uh, rotation such that the leading hemisphere in the, in the direction of the apex of, of the orbital motion intercepts the dust coming in from TV and deposits it. And that, at least is in large part, in my view anyway, the reason for the fact that uh, the Iapetus leading hemisphere has a low albedo. The, not only is it low albedo, but it has an extremely red color. So when we began to get good data from the Zooms instrument on spacecraft, one of the obvious things to go looking for was some indication of what that dark material might be, extending what we had done from ground-based spectroscopy and spectrometry in the prior years. So in the mid-2010s, uh, we began to uh, analyze these data, and we published a couple of papers on what we think is a, at least a component of the dark material on IAPA. Now, the data that we originally published in 2012 and 2013 are being re-examined in the light of a new calibration of the VIS instrument. The new calibration produces a, uh, a less contaminated spectrum with noise spikes and issues related to filter transition wavelengths and all that. But I'm putting 
this up here in, in the upper left is uh, Don's iconic diagram. What we might be looking for if we uh, are looking for organic. And then in the larger panel, we see the issue uh, of just how difficult it is to ease out any kind of absorption feature at those wavelengths uh, from the diaphanous data. The red line is where it uh, represents the, the best data we have from uh, the continuing spacecraft with the new uh, calibration, which was just made available six months or so ago. And I've indicated where the organic absorption bands are. The problem is they put on that very steep slope in the spectrum, and the whole absorption center is about three microns. The conversation of H2O and OH. But we're trying to pull out a very weak signal uh, on uh, data which requires to have some noise. Now, the, the black line is a model that uh, Roger Clark calculated, and it basically fits the spectrum very nicely at short wavelengths and up to about 3.7 or so. And we use this model not because we think, at least I don't think, that uh, I have is covered with nano phase iron and iron bearing hydrosilicate. They may be a component. Uh, Roger's uh, view is that that may be, in fact, amazing. But what we're using is the, uh, the model to give us a continuum continuum across the region of the organic band. And so when we extract the, uh, the residual weak feature on that steep slope, we get this, and I won't go through all the, the misery involved in trying to do this, but the net result is a smooth residual spectrum shown in the lower right-hand panel. So this, again, is uh, a revision of earlier work that we did on Avenue. And what we see here is what we also saw in that earlier version is the 3.4 micron absorption region, but to our considerable surprise, there's also a quite a prominent band at the several sigma confidence level, centered at about 3.28. And that is definitely not the aliphatic absorption band, but instead is at the right wavelength for aromatic pH stretch. So let's uh, assume that this reduction is reliable and that we have now a profile of the average spectrum shows both the aromatic and the aliphatic band. The aliphatics were not a surprise, but the aromatic was. I mentioned yesterday in Simone's uh, presentation that it would be nice to decompose the aliphatic band that he's seeing in other sources into the, uh, the, the four main components, which are listed in that table over on the left. And he agreed that that's one of the things they're trying to do. One of the virtues of that is that if you can really evaluate the relative contributions of the CH2 and CH3 groups, you get some idea of the length of the chain of the aliphatic components that make up this, uh, this broader absorption. And I think I may have a slide later that illustrates how that comes about. But in the long chain of uh, carbon atoms, the, uh, the, the atoms on the end of the chain have the CH3 attached, and the ones along the path uh, between the two ends have the CH2. So a, a ratio of CH2 to CH3 gives some kind of an idea of the length of these chains. And they tend to be small, that is, of order uh, CH2 to CH3 of about two and a half to three to four. And this is not, not inconsistent with the values that are derived in a similar analysis for the bands in the interstellar uh, medium and the secret galaxy that I showed at the very, very beginning. So it's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. And it may be indicative, if not totally analytical, of the uh, nature of these uh, absorption uh, features. But just to also reiterate what was said earlier, you can determine these stretching modes, but that does not lead automatically to a molecule. So you have to use other information which is remaining to be obtained, we hope, with the James Webb space telescope, which will probe a region of the spectrum of longer wavelengths where the individual molecules have a better chance of being identified. So I won't uh, spend much more time on this, except to say that this is still a kind of an iffy business in the sense that the spectral resolution or sampling interval of the continuous instrument is really not very high uh, to enable a fully reliable and robust identification of these of the band that uh, we tried to do here in, uh, anyway, in spite of the, the limitations. Um, and incidentally, we used the, uh, the modified gauss 
Platinum fitting routine that Jessica Sunshine developed years ago, which is a, a very convenient way of decomposing a band complex like this. So thanks to Jessica for that uh, tool that we continue to use quite excellent. We compare the uh, Iapetus organic signature with the uh, signatures of reflective spectra of a few other uh, materials. We have Murchison on the top, uh, EET, which is another primitive carbonation speedy right, and then tag slate. And the curious thing is that, uh, as expected, Murchison and EET uh, do not show the uh, aromatic band of 3.28, but tag slate seems to. <coughs> and the tag slate spectrum was provided kindly by Colin Alexander and Bert Cody uh, about 10 years ago. And when I asked the Alexander about this, he didn't know what it was either. It's possible that it's not an aromatic band, but um, failing to identify it in any other way, uh, we're accepting that it probably indicates aromatic absorption. Now, meteorites all contain aromatic uh, hydrogen. There's no question about that. You can take them apart from the lab and find all this stuff. But curiously, they don't show the band at 3.28 microns when you look at them either in reflective or in transmission spectrum. Uh, incidentally, my two molecules shown at the top there are just a generic uh, aromatic and uh, aliphatic molecules. And the one on the right, the aliphatic, you can see the CH2 to CH3 issue that I mentioned about the CH3 is on the end of the chain, and the CH2 is along the path. Um, but interestingly enough, in the earlier analysis done with the previous calibration of them, we saw a similar, very similar, spectral signature, including the aromatic, in the spectra of both EV and Hyperion. Now, that seems to be consistent with the view that dust liberated from EV comes from the interior, by the way, not from the surface, as you would expect, and is liberated as uh, spread through the inner, uh, inner part of the Saturn system. It never gets much beyond Hyperion, and if it does, it's intercepted by Titan, and that's the end of the story for EV dust, so far as we know. Uh, a conclusion based on the analysis by Dan Tamayo and his colleagues that was published shortly after the, um, the discovery of the Phoebe ring and also harkens back to much earlier work by Joe Burns and, and company in which they showed that if there were dust at Phoebe, it would spiral in and it would be accreted uh, by the uh, leading hemisphere of, Hi of, of Hyapetus. So that's all a nice tidy picture and it has been made beautifully clear, in my view, by the discovery of the Phoebe ring and by the reanalysis by Tamayo and company, which show that uh, the original idea was, it was quite sound. Next, please. Well, I wanted to mention another molecule which is, uh, is showing up in the outer solar system, and that's methanol. Yvonne made the point of the importance of methanol in the interstellar uh, environment because it's a gateway to making CH twos and CH3s and other things, and we actually find methanol in, uh, well, we find it in comets, of course, but it was found first in 19, and published in 1998 on one of the centaur objects, Pholus. Now, we knew the Pholus was interesting very quickly after it was discovered because its uh, visible region spectrum showed this very red color. Uh, subsequent observations, partly by my colleagues and me in Hawaii, uh, showed that uh, not only was it red in color, in fact, at that time, the reddest known object in the outer solar system, but it also was uh, very low in albedo. So this brings to mind, you know, what is the relationship to Iapetus, if any. And in the end, we were able to piece together a spectrum from data from various sources, and that's what you see in the uh, bottom part of this, uh, of this figure. And then our models, which included methanol. We also tested an, another interesting molecule that has interstellar uh, consequences and significance, and that's the hexamethylene tetramine, uh, which sounds funny, but it's actually a quite a reasonable molecule and is almost certainly present in the interstellar medium. But methanol overall gives a better fit. Subsequently, additional data from other sources confirmed the presence of this absorption band on Pholus, and it, the methanol has also been found on at least one other object uh, in the centaur population. So methanol seems to be there, and I just put it in here because it has to be uh, book kept as a Im potentially important molecule as we explore objects in the outer solar system. Next, please. Okay, uh, this is a recent work on the ratio of carbon 
uh, 12 to 13. I don't want to take time to explain this. It's work that's being submitted, and so we'll come back to this. It's really Roger Clark's baby, and he'll, uh, next please, he'll be talking about that. Um, okay, now let's go quickly to uh, Pluto and Charon, the other part of this talk. And here we now depend on, in the first instance, ground-based spectra. The lower left panel is this beautiful composite spectrum that Will Grundy and his colleagues assembled from uh, NASA IRTF data. And it shows the complex and intriguingly interesting spectrum of Pluto in the region from 1 to 2.6 microns. Uh, what you see is the dominance of uh, methane. Uh, there's uh, uh, nitrogen there. It's a little bitty thing at 2.15, but it's enormously important on the surface of Pluto, despite its, uh, its uh, uh, sort of unimposing spectral feature there at that wavelength. There's also carbon monoxide, which turns out to be an important molecule for all kinds of things, and some indications of H2O, which were later confirmed by, uh, by the New Horizons spacecraft. Uh, Charon, I don't want to spend time on that. It's got a fascinating spectrum, again, ground-based data, uh, with indications of an ammonia-bearing material, probably an ammonium hydrate or an ammonia hydrate. But that's uh, still work in progress, and we don't have a, a, a nice clean identification of that feature, although at 2.12 or so, although it has been confirmed in several uh, subsequent data sets, including New Horizons. Well, the amazing thing about, new, uh, about the uh, uh, pluto charon system is that there are strongly colored regions. Despite all the spectral evidence for ices, uh, there is some non-ice component. Next to it. And that non-ice component can be seen if we take the spectral images from New Horizons and map out the locations on the, the encounter hemisphere of methane, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide. And I, so those bright patches for each of those three molecules indicates the, the way the stuff is distributed, and I don't want to go into that, but instead to point out in the lower left-hand part of the, uh, of the disk, there's a region that doesn't seem to have much ice, if any, except a few scattered uh, points, possibly, of carbon monoxide. So what is that stuff? That presumably, and that is the most colored region on the surface of Pluto, most intensely colored. Next, please. That, we assume, is in fact a non-ice component and we desperately want to identify that, so we do what we can. Uh, there's one particularly interesting region on Pluto, again, now in a high-resolution view of the surface. Um, the upper left hand is an elevation map, and you see a channel there, or a fossa, or a graben. And in the bottom of the graben, we have water ice, and we have very red stuff that is, in fact, uniquely red. It's even redder than the other parts of Pluto's surface. And decomposed into four separate uh, components on the basis of the New Horizons LISA imaging spectra. We can see the distributions of this stuff. There's no nitrogen, no methane or, yeah, to speak of, but there is the water and there is the red material. Uh, we're carrying in this slide just a generic red material um, label, but I think I know what it is. And let's go on to the next slide. Here's, by, way, by the way, a a higher res view of that colored region, which, uh, as you can see, blends into the icy parts, higher albedo region, um, in ways that tend to look like this, some of this stuff has been wind blown. Uh, although the winds on Pluto now are essentially non-existent, there is the expectation that in the past the atmospheric pressure was substantially higher and, in fact, may have uh, produced winds, and that may be responsible for carrying some of this reddish material, whatever its origin to uh, the surfaces in the way that you see. But let's go on to the next one, please. Now, back to the initial impression that this is, first of all, non-ice, but it's very likely to be an organic complex. Uh, I'm showing here some uh, solons, which are these complex organic materials that are refractory and are made by energy deposition, uh, either by electrons or uh, other charged particles or ultraviolet, in mixes of both gas and ice that contain uh, a source of carbon. It doesn't have to be a hydrocarbon, but hydrocarbons are the favored ones, and other stuff as well. So what you see in the upper left is a suite of uh, different colors of solens made uh, with a gaseous mixture of uh, nitrogen and, and methane, 
at different pressures. And in the work of Hiroshi Yamanaka, published in his PhD thesis uh, almost 15 years ago, you can see in, in this particular suite of, uh, of data that the color, which is represented by those color uh, lines on, the, uh, on that graph, uh, the color depends on the pressure of the, uh, the gaseous mixture. Lower pressures, in this case 13 pascals on the limit, uh, produce the darker colors, and the higher pressures, uh, which are far beyond what Pluto's atmospheric pressure is now, produce the lighter and up to yellow colors. So that's an, an interesting issue, uh, at least about the formation of atmospheric tholins. And the next slide shows that we also can produce tholins by depositing energy as the UV or, or electrons in a, an ice mixture. So this uh, is a picture of uh, some experiments that we did a couple of years ago with uh, my postdoc, uh, Chris Matteris, shown there with the apparatus. In this case, we froze a mixture of nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide in what we had already determined were appropriate uh, Pluto proportions, uh, irradiated, irradiated it, and produced this colored swatch that you see in the middle. And that color, if you do it quantitatively, matches the visible colors of the uh, colored regions on both Pluto itself as well as the north polar region of Charon. So we think we have a clue as to something that seems to be relevant to Pluto. Ices, irradiation, colors. Next, please. We take that stuff apart because we have a nice refractory sample in the lab. And this is our notional structure, which consists of these aromatic rings that are loosely held together by uh, aliphatic uh, bridging units, as they're called, with nitrogen substituted here and there. And when you irradiate an ice mixture like that with electrons, you get breakup of the N2 molecule, which uh, and the N2 atoms are then free um, to join in uh, holding hands with carbons and to make a high nitrogen-rich structure like this. And if we further analyze this material, we see the kinds of components you see there, alcohols, urea, carboxylic acids, and so on. So that is a clue, I think, as to what the organic chemistry is on Pluto, at least as deduced from this comparison of color uh, with the uh, laboratory data we take. Now, I have to say, we cannot see on Pluto any specific spectral band that match spectral bands in the, the tholin that we make. At the same time, the tholin we make has extremely weak spectral band in the region of the spectrum where we can observe Pluto. So again, we're waiting for um, JWST to uh, open the window farther into the infrared where we have a better chance of seeing diagnostic spectral features. Next, please. Um, I won't spend any time on this. We think uh, Will Grundy has a paper in press, basically, that talks about the red pole on Charon. And you can look at the, uh, the text I have here, which is a very brief summary of his ideas. But let's move on to the next one. OK, this is now conclusions. So in the case of the Saturn satellites, we see this CH stretching mode, in certainly in the aliphatic, and we are confident that it's present in the aromatic hydrocarbons as well, which shows solid organic material, both in association with ice and alone. Uh, in the case of Iapetus and Hyperion, this material presumably originated at Phoebe, which may have brought this, this spectral characteristic and this composition of signature uh, from its point of origin, uh, probably in the Kuiper belt. Uh, the carbon-13 to 12 anomaly, which Roger Clark has been explicating, uh, appears to support the contention that Phoebe originated outside of the Saturn system. And in the case of Pluto, we see a colored non-ice material, which appears to be the product of the radiation and uh, ir irradiation and photolysis of hydrocarbons plus nitrogen in both Pluto's atmosphere and on the icy surface. And we're hopeful that comparisons of the organic and the interstellar medium, again, extended to the longer wavelengths that JWST will afford, may help uh, connect the Saturn system and Pluto and other KBOs and other outer solar system bodies to the origin of the organic components in the interstellar medium, transferred into the solar nebula, and ultimately becoming a significant component of the planetary bodies that form there. Now, that's a, a going in uh, desirement. As usual, the story turns out to be 
either very different or at least far more complicated. But we have, we are pinning a lot of hopes on the James Webb Space Telescope and the opportunity to look at the spectrum of all these objects and many more in a part of the spectrum that is uh, more diagnostic than the limited data that we currently have. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. So I think we are now open for questions. Uh, we have a bunch in this room, so Simone. Hi, Dale. Uh, Simone speaking. Um, I have a comment and a question. The comment is related to the what you mentioned in your talk about, uh, uh, you know, the iPhotic from theorist. In fact, I went back and double checked. Uh, there is a paper that is presumably pressed where the, co the, the convolution of the absorption has been done in great detail. So I'll make sure to send that to you as soon as it's on the online. Um, and, the, yeah, and the question I have is uh, related to the methanol uh, observation that you discussed for false. I'm not very familiar with the methanol. Uh, I remember Yvonne mentioned that yesterday as a very important uh, molecule. Um, so the question I have, is it the methanol, is it it's primordial on follows or is it the result of some sort of internal evolution? That's something that we would like to understand. Uh, or surface chemistry, you know. Um, the reason why I'm asking this question is because uh, looking at the visible and near infrared spectrum of follows, it's very similar with some of the Trojans. So, I'm just wondering if this is something we should expect for some of the Lucy targets, for instance, because we will, we will see, you know, Trojan up close. Uh, certainly, it's, uh, it's worth looking for in detail, but just to, uh, if I understood you correctly, um, Follis is very different from the Trojan in that the Trojans, to my knowledge, don't show any spectral features uh, in the region out to 2.5 microns. Uh, Josh Emery and company have looked at that very closely. But uh, certainly to keep an open mind uh, for what might be found uh, in the Trojan population by Lucy, it's, uh, it, it, that's one of the things that makes it such an important investigation. Uh, there may be methanol. It's fairly volatile. It may not survive at five uh, astronomical units. I'm not sure about that. But uh, that, in fact, may be the, the fate of all of the volatiles on the surface of the Trojans that they may have uh, evaporated away. But it's a voyage of discovery, and uh, I'm standing by to, to get the results from that, just as any others are. Yeah, and Thank just, you. just perhaps uh, a quick follow-up on that. It is true that Josh Emmett and others have shown uh, lack of any absorption in, at that wavelength. However, the signal to noise but it's also very poor, um, so I wouldn't rule out, you know, the possibility for some interesting absorption in that uh, region. I agree with you. I have a question. Um, Hale, I was going to ask, this is Amanda, I was going to ask you, because I thought I might have missed it because I was having to deal with technical stuff, is, and then I heard you say that you were surprised that you saw an aromatic band on Iapetus, but not the aliphatic band. And then I realized that it's because comparing with Murchison, you don't see, I, I think this is what you were meaning, that you don't see the aromatic feature on Murchison and other meteorites. Um, and I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that and why you don't see it in the spectra, even though they're there. I wish I knew. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and Either. Hang on, you've got an echo. We're dealing with an echo here. Yeah. yeah. Do we know why? Okay. Uh, yeah. you, no, it hasn't been cleared up yet. Right when that started? Yeah. <coughs> Someone needs to hit mute. And they yeah, type there. in there, people, <laughs> tell people to mute. <coughs> okay, I'll just go back quickly then to Amanda's question. Um, but to, to make a minor correction to what you said, okay. we were looking for the aromatic, sorry, for the aliphatic band. It showed up as well as the aromatic band, and the aromatic was the big surprise. Um, and I also showed that spectrum, that uh, suite of three spectra on the left-hand margin of one of the slides that had Murchison at the top and Tagish Lake at the bottom. If you go back and look at the inventory of aromatics in those two, uh, two meteorites, 
Murchison has more aromatics than Taggy Schlake does. And so how does this happen? Uh, does it throw into question the identification of the aromatic band at all? Um, or, and if so, what is it? But it's a curiosity that we see the aromatic material in the chemical analysis of these meteorites, but we don't see it expressed spectroscopically. Now, this could be issues of particle size, of the way the aromatics are bonded to one another and to other things, minerals perhaps. Uh, and I don't have an answer for that, but it is recognized as one of the outstanding open issues to pursue. I wonder if it could have something to do with surface exposure on the surface of Iapetus uh, and other bodies as compared with meteorites. I guess a weathering effect somehow. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Maybe that nope, relates to grain size like you were suggesting. Huh. Okay. Yeah. But I'm just re grabbing for things out of the air. I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm extremely interested if uh, the lab folks and the cosmochemists can figure it out. So we have a question from the chat uh, room, which is: Have lab experiments provided spectra in the five to eight micron region where skeletal stretching modes might resonate? Thinking of n substituted aromatic bands, aromatic bonds. If you're, uh, Diane, if you're referring to the, uh, uh, the work that we did with this so-called Pluto isotolan, uh, yes. And uh, we have done spectroscopy in the 5 to 8 micron region. Uh, there are no astronomical data in that region that I'm aware of. Uh, um, and they do show the nitrogen substitution in the aromatic uh, structures, which is in large part the basis for that notional structure diagram that I showed. Um, let's see. In the case of Iapetus, the 5 to 8 micron region is, uh, has been observed, but it doesn't really show anything. And it's because in that region, uh, even for a cold object like Iapetus, which has a surface temperature of order 90 or so Kelvin, um, you're into the thermal region and seeing any spectral contrast against a thermal spectrum is challenging at best. And so the 5 to 8 micron region uh, for Iapetus, uh, to my knowledge, with the latest uh, studies of those data, uh, don't show anything. So we're kind of sunk there. Um, OK, then we, we, have one, we have another question, which is the 2.8, or maybe a comment. The 2.8 micron of the aromatic is due to the pH uh, yeah. stretching mode, and you can have aromatic with methyl groups attached on the aromatic <coughs> ring. And in this case, you will not have any more as any more CH group to vibrate. That's an interesting point. Uh, if the, um, yeah, mm -hmm. if the hydrogens are all uh, substituted with other uh, functional groups, that, uh, th that's an interesting point. And I will uh, take that into consideration um, and uh, talk to my uh, chemistry friends ab about that here, too, to see if that um, either can be duplicated in the lab uh, or if they have any other perspective on it. So thank you very much for that comment. It's worth, uh, worth pursuing that point. There's more. And she also is asking. Yeah. Uh, Do you want me to it, read it? it? Uh, no, I can read it. it uh, I think you're re referring to the, the, the 3.28 micron rather than the 2.8 micron. I, I think that's what uh, she's um, referring to. And uh, it's, um, it's not that faint. It's within the range of you know, a, a several, a several sigma detection. Uh, the, the data that we analyzed from the previous calibration of VIMS uh, showed it quite prominently. The new calibration suggests that it's not as strong as we originally thought. But uh, it's still there with a high degree of confidence. OK, we'll the, do the, one more quick question from Bill Botkey, and then we'll move on. Hi, Neil. I, I wanted to ask you sort of a, a, a hypothetical question. So when we look at Phoebe, uh, you know, we're seeing today's surface. But the thinking is, is that maybe the irregular satellite population was larger in the past. And Phoebe may have really been hit hard. And so we may be looking at something of an exposed interior, possibly. Would that affect your interpretation at all? Um, I mean, essentially, let's say you're not just looking at an intact object, but something that's been blasted by quite a bit. Uh, how would that affect some of the things you're looking at, or at least your interpretation of those things? 
Well, I'm not sure I quite understand. The, the current state of Phoebe's surface, as was noted yesterday, is that it's gray and, uh, and different in color from Iapetus. And it was uh, on the basis of that difference that people originally uh, questioned the idea of Phoebe as the source of the material on Iapetus. Uh, but then in thinking about it, uh, any material blasted off of Phoebe is dominated by stuff from the interior. And so that particular conundrum, I think, has kind of uh, vanished into the woodwork. But you're asking something different, I think, Bill. Um, yeah, I think, and, and I mean, I, I guess in some of the modeling work I've done on the irregular satellites, um, there used to be a big population there that mostly has gone away by collisional evolution. So that makes me think that uh, Phoebe, in some sense, could have been modestly larger. Maybe it's lost kilometers on the surface, maybe tens of kilometers on the surface. It's hard, really hard to say. And I just wanted to see, does that, does that model prediction make any difference for how we interpret Phoebe? Well, I don't think that that, per se, would affect this very much, unless okay. the bulk composition of Phoebe were altered by those, uh, uh, those uh, numerous collisions that you described. Uh, there, there is one interesting, perhaps related point about the images of Phoebe that came in from the imaging system on Cassini, and that is some of the largest, freshest craters appear to show a layer of very dark material just below the optical surface, so to speak. And that, uh, that layer, which must be you know, at least a kilometer thick, is uh, darker in color and uh, looks like a, a, a stratum that uh, came about from the way of what, whatever uh, put Phoebe together in the first place. That presence of that, um, that layer close to the surface might suggest that, um, well, I don't know what to suggest from it, but it, it to me says that Phoebe was assembled wherever it came from uh, by a process which made, in fact, a layering um, structure in the uppermost uh, mantle and crust, let's say. So that, that may or may not figure into what you're talking about. But you might want to go back and look at some of the, the reprocessed ISS images of Phoebe on the one encounter that we had. And uh, have a look for that, uh, that layer and see what you make of it. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it, it sounds very interesting. Thanks. I've got one more question. Um, this has probably been asked before, but at the moment I can't think of what the answer is. And that is, um, why don't we see reddish Phoebe dust on the surface of Phoebe? Is it just masked by the darker carbonized surface of Phoebe? Well, uh, yes, but uh, just to note that we did see the aliphatic and probably the aromatic uh, spectral features on Phoebe. Right. Right. And from, we infer that the, uh, some of, the, of its own dust has fallen back on the surface, right. uh, again, liberated from the interior. But the color difference, I don't know. Um, Maybe it's a thin enough layer. I don't know. But you know, it's it's a, an interesting piece of the puzzle. But um, at least, and, and by the way, we are reanalyzing uh, both the data from Phoebe and Hyperion uh, in light of the new calibration. So we haven't even published the, the new calibration data of Iapetus yet. The hope is that in the next uh, 10 months or so, we can complete the reanalysis of the other two. Uh, satellites in question and uh, come up with a revised and uh, we hope a sharper uh, overall picture of the, the whole process and the whole system. Look at Jeff Cuzzy's. Okay. Cuzzy's online. Uh, Will Grundy once suggested that H2 embedding is important to bring out the redness. Oh. Uh, hmm. oh. Well, uh, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I would have to go back and see what Will had to say from an organic. Uh, well, I, I guess it sounds kind of arm wavy, but then I've been waving my arms here too. So <laughs> I'll go back and look at that and, in fact, talk to Will and see if he has any uh, new perspective on that issue. Hey, Dale, this is Faith. Can I ask one real fast question, I think? Um, and that is, I just wondered if the reddish material on Pluto, do you have any idea of the windblown stuff, how old it is? Do you have any wags on that? Well, my tendency is to think that it's very old. Um, one of the complicating factors is that studies of the current atmosphere of Pluto, which has a surface pressure of about 10 microbars, or one pascal, 
that in that atmosphere, I mean, we see 20 layers of haze. So there's something going on in Pluto's atmosphere. And the view is that that is making aerosol particles which precipitate to the surface. Now, the problem okay. is that if this uh, goes on for a, a billion years or even 100 million years, you would expect to make the surface of uh, Pluto quite uniform in color just by the accumulation of this stuff. And it's clearly not uh, uniform in color or in albedo. So I think that the, the issue of the ages, relative ages of this stuff, uh, when it was made, when it was deposited, when it was blown around, is really wide open for new analysis, new perspectives, and we're trying to provide some of that. The data are available to the outside community now, and so I'm hopeful that there'll be a lot of um, discussion of this kind of thing, uh, including the age of the Tholans, the age of the coloration, uh, and so on in the literature for the next 10 years. So good question. Um, work in progress, I'd say. Thank you. Okay, so I think we will move on to the next talk.